Life is a game of dimensions. Every creature lives in its own spaces, its own set of dimensional rules. Some live close to the ground, a life spent in flat horizontality. Others yet soar through the sky, a freedom echoed in its immense verticality. We, too, live in such a rule set, bound to the earth, our heads arched skywards, surveying any incoming threats from above. But it is all too easy to forget that life has another domain besides the ground and the sky, that which lies beneath. The deep, be it of soil or of water, is not to be forgotten, lest one of its inhabitants surface in grim remembrance. The natural world is no stranger to the bizarre and the exceptional. Life, after all, comes in all shapes, sizes, and dispositions. Even a regular civilian is quite used to hearing tales of unusual creatures, and a monster hunter is unlikely to go far without encountering at least a few odd adversaries. But even the grandest tales and tallest lies are often confined to forests, cliff sides, and perhaps the skies. Few ever tell of that which lurks beneath us, the burrowers and swimmers of the monster frontier. A shame, for they represent some of the most outlandish beings known to the guild. The first of these creatures was discovered after numerous reports of man-eating dunes began flooding out of the Sekumea region. This area, located on the southwestern peninsula of the Old World continent, is a harsh desert that has been known to swallow careless travelers, spitting out their sun-bleached bones. But these reports were highly unusual. According to some witnesses, the dunes themselves had begun moving, clouds of sand purposefully torpedoing towards man and animal alike, dragging them into a deep desert grave within mere moments. The guild quickly determined this to be the work of a monster. They had no idea of what kind, but it at least seemed more likely than sentient flesh-eating sand mounds. The dispatch team of hunters and researchers then quickly discovered that this phenomenon was in fact caused by a flock of sand-dwelling Piscine Wyvern. The Piscine Wyvern classification has, since its initial proposal by the scholarly library of Mindguard, been a cause for much debate and controversy within the guild. On paper, their defining traits are somewhat simple. Wyvern that generally live submerged in water, often sporting fins and other fish-like features. The problem with this simple definition is that it doesn't hold up to even the most casual observation of Piscine Wyvern. Some have wings, some don't swim in water, and many of them have lungs. And just when a working hypothesis of their origin had been established, a theory that proposed that they had actually branched off from flying wyvern, hence the wings and lungs, a new species was discovered on the new continent that entirely rebuked all of that. The guild thus classifies Piscine wyverns as its own order, Piscilacertis, itself containing three suborders into which all known Piscine wyverns are sorted. The majority of them are contained in just one suborder, Pishipoda, fish feet, defined by having semi-terrestrial hind legs and feet. It was into this suborder that the man-eating dunefish of Sekumea was sorted, 
properly described and classified under the name Cephalos. These hammer-headed wyvern exemplify the extreme difficulty of describing Piscine wyvern as a homogeneous group. While they do swim, they do so not in water, but through fine sand, patrolling the deserts of the peninsula in flocks that travel through the ground at extraordinary speeds. They are quite common in the deserts, and the only reason the guild hadn't discovered them earlier was that they are mostly nocturnal, generally only surfacing at night. Once they were discovered, however, their unusual bodies immediately garnered the attention of many researchers. Cephalos have surprisingly well-developed wings, and while they cannot be used to fly, they do seem to help in maneuvering through the sand and jumping out while surfacing. It was this feature that initially led researchers to believe that they were dealing with some sort of abnormal flying wyvern. But, as the life of the Cephalos was gradually uncovered, its wings became its least interesting feature. Cephalos are almost entirely blind. After all, eyesight would not be of any use when swimming through sand. Instead, they use their hearing and skin to feel out vibrations and sounds in the sand, allowing them to maneuver quite accurately across the dune plains. It also helps that deserts are generally quite empty, and so most of the time, the only source of vibrations will be other living beings. Their hammer-shaped head is specialized in pushing sand to the side, allowing the creature to reach extremely high speeds considering that they're pushing through a solid medium. Using these abilities, the Cephalos home in on any unfortunate target before preying upon it in a most gruesome fashion. As they approach their victim, the Cephalos flock will stick out their fins to protrude out from the sand. In these fins, the Cephalos store a paralyzing venom that is injected by brushing the fin tips on the skin of another creature. By swimming past and around their target repeatedly, the flock quickly envenomates it, making it unable to move. Instead of simply killing it right there on the surface, the flock of Cephalos will then latch onto their prey and drag it with them deep into the sand, knowing that its silent, paralyzed screams will soon be suffocated by the dense sand flooding its orifices. Once deceased, the victim will be devoured by the sandfish. Cephalos are however not merely carnivores. As they swim, they swallow large amounts of sand, which a special organ in their abdomen then filters to extract valuable minerals and organic matter from. This way, cephalos are constantly nourishing themselves as long as they swim, through the microparticles that they find in the sand. Adapted to life in the sand they may be, cephalos cannot solely live underground. As bizarre as they can seem, they still have lungs, and so they must surface regularly in order to replenish their oxygen. This is when the cephalos are at their most vulnerable. They are much less graceful on land, as their heavy wyvern feet allow them only to slowly stomp across the dunes. But even then, the cephalos are not entirely defenseless. The sand that is filtered out from their digestive system after they swallow it is not simply discarded, but instead stored in a specialized sand sack. This sack can regurgitate the sand into the wyvern's mouth at will. The roof of the cephalos mouth secretes a thick type of secondary saliva, an adhesive mucus whose main purpose is to mix with the regurgitated sand and form hard clumps of sandy mud. These clumps can then be spat by the cephalos as a projectile, allowing it to ward off adversaries. The most powerful defense and offense of a flock of cephalos is their pack leader, the massive cephadrome. Transformed by an hormonal flush, these immense wyvern are generally at the heart of any cephalos flock. While they borrow the name drome from the alpha leaders of old world raptors, cephadromes do not actually lead the flock. There doesn't seem to be any kind of hierarchy or social dynamic at play. 
Rather, a flock of cephalos simply naturally follows a cephadrome for its strength and durability. Their congregation is merely a sound survival strategy. And indeed, a cephadrome is a fierce protector, twice the size of a normal cephalos, all of its physical abilities are enhanced. Its paralyzing venom is more potent, its sand sack is larger, and its darkened hide is more durable. It is even more longevious. A cephadrome can live up to twice as long as a cephalos. Throughout the year, the cephalos flocks travel the night deserts, protected by their cephadrome, always looking for food. But beyond mere survival, they are also waiting. Waiting for the wet season. As the storms rage in the skies above Sekumea, various low areas in the desert become temporarily waterlogged. And this is crucial to the very existence of the cephalos. Despite being so adapted to life in the sand, cephalos can only lay their eggs in water, perhaps a leftover from a previous ancestor. After the eggs have been laid in the temporary pools, the flock leaves again, leaving the eggs to hatch by themselves. By the time the next generation actually hatches, their nursery pool will have shrunk into a small, muddy puddle. The juvenile cephalos are then on a time limit. They instinctively know how to swim through water, but they must adapt to swimming in sand as well before their little pond dries up. Ideally, as the moisture around them vanishes, their swimming ability increases, allowing them to eventually attain the agility of their parents. Once the nursing pool has entirely dried up, the cephalos that manage to adapt venture out on their own, to either grow into a cephadrome or assimilate into an existing flock. Only in these early years can the true skin of the cephalos be seen, Adults have their body covered in hardened brown sand, but in juveniles and adolescents, the brilliant blue scales are still visible for a short time before their beauty, too, is swallowed by the desert. The cephalos were a wake-up call to many scholars, a reminder that the world is still brimming with the unknown. And it especially ignited an interest in the study of Piscine Wyvern, a fire that led to the scouring of all nooks and crannies previously ignored. This fervor was not entirely scientific. Both the eggs and the liver of the cephalos were quickly discovered to be quite tasty, and they soon became the luxury food item we know them as today. As these new goods stimulated the economy and increased demand for hunters, the guild was eager to discover more Piscine wyvern like the Cephalos, in hopes of furthering its prosperity with new, exotic goods to circulate. Unfortunately for the Hunters Guild, what the researchers were about to discover was far from an easy source of valuable materials. Following up on old reports and oral histories regarding fish-like wyvern, scholars soon stumbled upon their next great discovery, and huge it was, in a very literal sense. Deep in the old jungle, lurking in the dark waters of the Arcolis region, they found the Plesioth. The Plesioth is, in one word, enormous. At the time of its discovery, it was considered the largest wyvern known to the guild, and even now, many years and discoveries later, it still holds its position as one of the most massive extant monsters. This size is only possible due to its aquatic lifestyle. The buoyancy of the water it lives in allows it to reach dimensions that would be crushing under the gravity of a land-dwelling lifestyle. The Plesioth's enormity has inspired numerous legends in the regions it inhabits, and the guild found it while investigating reports of villagers watching a giant fish tear apart a jungle gharial, a species of mega crocodilian that itself reaches well over 10 meters in length. Soon after its discovery, the Plesioth was declared the pinnacle of aquatic life. Despite its enormous size, 
Its numerous fins allow it to swim at extraordinary speeds. Its wing-like main fins are especially powerful, and a plesioth at full speed can outswim just about anything. Its razor-sharp teeth and venomous fin spikes can make short work of any prey it hunts, and due to its muscular body, the plesioth can maneuver around the deep effortlessly. Just like the cephalos, it too is blind, and relies on its hearing to navigate the environment. In service of this, its hearing has become nearly supernatural, able to pick up on even the slightest intrusions into its territory. These adaptations make the Plesioth one of the most successful predators of the Old World waters. They even compete with crocodilians in the highly coveted Water Edge Predator niche, where they ambush and forcefully drown animals that get too close to the edge of the water. But also just like the Cephalos, the Plesioth is not able to entirely abandon the surface. Plesioth also have lungs, which are tasked with the unenviable dilemma of delivering oxygen continuously to a positively massive body. The solution is that the Plesioth doesn't just breathe through its protruding nose, but through its entire skin allowing it to circulate oxygen rapidly and efficiently. There is a catch, however. The Plesioth skin can only breathe when it is wet, and it is extremely prone to drying out when not in direct contact with water. Paradoxically then, the moment the Plesioth surfaces in order to replenish its oxygen, its breathing begins to immediately degrade. Prolonged exposure to air will in fact suffocate the Plesioth. To mitigate this, Plesioth only surface partially, sticking close to the water surface and poking out various body parts for short periods at a time for a quick and safe replenishment. While it is exceptionally rare, there are cases where Plesioth venture on land. Despite their ecological success, they are believed to be rather unintelligent, and are known to throw temper tantrums that cause them to be quite reckless. Should a prey have enraged and frustrated them by continuously evading, the Plesioth will furiously chase it even onto dry land. Similarly, they can be lured onto terra firma by its favorite snack, frogs. For reasons unimportant to science, the Plesioth love to eat frogs, and will walk into obvious traps and dangers just for the chance of tasting one, including venturing on land. A ground Plesioth is a much slower, clumsier fighter compared to the graceful swimmer. Its large hind legs allow it to walk, but its massive size and weight make it quite unwieldy. While the Plesioth can run, it can only do so for very short bursts at a time, and only in a straight line. Most damningly, however, fighting on land is extremely risky, as the wyvern skin dries out rapidly. That is, however, not to say that a plesioth is easy prey on land. Its massive weight and size make even the clumsiest movements deadly to any that stand too close. Its tail swipes are lethal, but its most terrifying maneuver is its hip check, where it swings its entire weight hip first into an opponent. Unarmored humans have been observed to basically disintegrate into formless fleshy pulp from the sheer force of that impact. Engaging a Plesioth is always risky. In the worst case scenario, a frustrated Plesioth may turn to using its most powerful weapon. Just how the Cephalos repurposes all the sand it swallows while burrowing, the Plesioth also has an aqua sac that stores up the water it ingests while feeding. This water can be regurgitated through a nozzle in the Plesioth's mouth, allowing it to shoot out a highly pressurized water beam. This attack is extremely lethal and can cut apart most targets, and the more intelligent Plesioths will not wait to use it until they are cornered. 
they have been observed simply sticking their head out of the water to shoot their deadly beam at a dry target from the safety of their own domain. Luckily, Plesioths are not particularly common. With a body that size, large populations are hard to maintain in just one spot, so they generally live alone and far apart from each other. Interestingly, Plesioth can live in both freshwater and saltwater, as a regional variation has been found living in the open sea around the island district. The place where Plesioth are most common, however, is actually just one specific body of water. The Grand Arcolis River, which originates in the old jungle and flows southwards throughout much of the southwestern peninsula, flowing underground and resurfacing multiple times. This river also forms various underground lakes, which are known to be a preferred habitat for the Plesioth. Due to the sheer depth, width, and length of this river, the Plesioth can travel all across the western edge of the Old World continent with ease. In an ironic twist, this allows the Plesioth to even live in the oases and cave lakes of Sekumea, near where the Cephalos dwell. With ecological success comes proliferation and specialization, and the Plesioth is no exception. Beyond the freshwater and saltwater regional variations, the genus Plesioth also contains two distinct species. Plesioth squalus is the more common species, visually distinguishable by its dark blue coloration on its back and head. They are very fond of their watery habitats and only rarely venture to the surface at all. That cannot be said for the other species within the genus, Plesioth viridis, commonly known as the green Plesioth. If its brilliant coat of emerald green back scales was not enough to distinguish it from the other Plesioth species, the green Plesioth's behavior certainly will. While it inhabits the same general ecosystems as the blue Plesioth, the green Plesioth is much more comfortable on land. Its colored scales are a lot better at retaining moisture, allowing it to stay on land for much longer. Additionally, its leg muscles are much more developed and adapted to carrying the wyvern's weight on land. This makes the green Plesioth much more agile and secure on dry land, much to the terror of any prey that leaves the water in hopes for sanctuary. The depths below often terrify us. And for good reason. It is a domain exclusive to otherworldly creatures, predators and specialists with bodies and powers entirely alien to us. Monsters such as the Cephalos and the Plesioth remind us of how little power we hold in the abyss, and how easily we are dragged down, swallowed by the deep that they so easily conquer. Next time on Monster Hunter Ecology. Bellowing roars, moving mountains. The fire of the earth coagulates into a coffin of iron and brimstone. And among it all, a lineage of wyvern, bodies of rock and strength. Their breath magma, their voices thunder. The skin is shed, the rock is polished, and the rumbling king wakes. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Consider liking and subscribing if you want to see more of this. And also remember that I have a Patreon that you can subscribe to to get early access to all the videos. Speaking of Patreon, a huge thank you to all of our patrons, including Zeyeon H. V. Augenson, Korv621, Robs D. Hyrule, AJ Rivera, Alistair, Hui Hui, Jacob Bennett, Soruka, Gangratist, Sir Newt Newt, Orbital, Terador, Emperor Eevee, Rambling Robin, Lizric, Hashi, 
Marcus Jenkins, Dissy, Kane Eddy, Hubble Mirror 123, Magenta Magenta, Danilo Villavicencio, Arcturian 711, Russell, Person 212, Claire Miboon, Oakwood Tree, Mr. Pyramid, Pide Fuego, Makot O2, Project Iceman, Peroscoco, Geo, Jameson Tate, Nils Schlatter, Mr. Meander, Fiction Ape, Iron Camel, and Courage. Take care, friends, and I'll see you all next time.